All right, folks. Thank you. So testnet update progress is being made. We we have finished the migration from going from Cosmos SDK 0.47 to uh, 0.50. And that migration changed a lot of how modules work within the Cosmos SDK. So uh, it was going to be a big change from going from that one to the new one. So uh, the team has uh, essentially got all the code ready. They're now doing reviews and things of that nature. But uh, the goal this week was to uh, start doing final reviews of the code. And, and we're at that point. So, all right. I wanted to do a deep dive into Shannon tokenomic theories. Uh, this is not stuff that has been fully flushed out. This is kind of where we're at and where our mind is, but kind of the idea is we can start communicating uh, what tokenomics might look like in Shannon and some mechanisms that we're creating. And then from there, we're able to get community feedback. We're able to get uh, contributions, hopefully, uh, because there's a lot of there's a lot of elements that go into tokenomics, and you know you can't expect one person or one team to really be able to see everything from every angle. So the idea is just to kind of get some of this understanding out there, have people munching on it, get some questions going. Um, so before we talk about what we want to do with Shannon, it's just important to understand where we are with Morse today. So I uh, kind of created this this graph. Or, or this table that is going to be expanding, and I'm uh, going to go through it kind of step by step. So today, you know, we have around 400 million relays, um, and then when you look at the tokenomics of our burn to mint ratio, for every one pocket that is burned by gateways, 135 pocket is minted for nodes, uh, and so you know uh, that's what creates pockets inflation. Now the network inflation uh, is around five percent uh, network annual inflation. Um, but in a realistic term, when we look at the economics between gateways and nodes, you can see it as one burn equals 135 pocket minted. Now, with this kind of uh, with this kind of inflation of, of burn to mint, if a gateway had its own nodes, it could actually start sending burn. Uh, it could burn one pocket with to send. You know, let's say one pocket is uh, you know a, a thousand relays. It could burn one. Uh, one pocket to send a thousand relays to their own nodes. This would be in a completely, you know, permissionless environment that would create what we call and what we've always called in pocket self-dealing, where a gateway is able to see, oh, hey, I've got a session with my node in it. So I'm going to send all my relays to my node and just enjoy that 13,000% uh, return on my burn, right? Burn one, get 135. Uh, so you obviously can't have that kind of economic model with inside a pocket because uh, it would, you know, it would create targeted attacks and it would completely ruin the uh, economics of pocket. So, um, so how do you deal with, you know, possible gaming inside of Morse? Well, that's why gateways are not permissionless. Um, PNF currently safeguards from self dealing by requiring gateways to sign contracts with them uh, in a very legal sense so that there's protection against any kind of self-dealing. So these kind of contracts are signed with uh, Grove, they're signed with Nodies, they've been, they're uh, being signed or have signed with Liqui uh, Liquify, they were announced uh, recently. I don't know exactly where, they're, uh, where everything is with every gateway, but that's what the process is right now. PNF is what uh, allows there to be this burn to mint ratio without the gaming. But with PNF being involved, you can't have permissionless gateways. And if they do deal with permission, if they do any kind of self dealing, uh, they're legally liable for it. So there's a decent incentive to not do it. Um, all gateways are also uh, fully doxed with PNF. So that's kind of the system that has to be. Uh, but with uh, uh, stakers enjoy a 9% of APY. So because you know Pocket is able to burn one pocket, but still mint uh, 135 pocket, it creates you know a staking APY. And this staking APY is why people have locked up Pocket uh, inside the Pocket ecosystem. Uh, if there wasn't any reason or any return on locking up your tokens, why would anyone lock up their tokens? Uh, so uh, if you look at you know Pocket's Staking APY compared to something like Rocket Pool or Avalanche or Celestia, uh, you know we're we're all kind of in that same range. But it's important that there is a staking economy within Pocket so that 
tokens are locked because that's very beneficial for nodes. But then remember what I just talked about before about the self-dealing. Uh, within this system, how is self-dealing mitigated? Well, it's mitigated because PNF uh, uses legal means to ensure that folks aren't able to self-deal. So if you kind of use, look at this graph, this is a snapshot of what Morse is today in terms of its, you know, most bare bone uh, kind of economics, tokenomics uh, screenshot. That's what this is. Now, when we look at Shannon, you know, what would be the ideal tokenomics? Because first you start with what the ideal uh, environment looks like, uh, kind of what your what your goal is. So I've created this now as a goal of where we want to get uh, Shannon tokenomics. So in order to do this, you have to do one kind of main major change between uh, Morse today and now. And a big factor is increasing the relays from 400 million a day to 25 billion. So if we had a lot more relays on the network, this is what Shannon could ultimately look like. You could have a burn ratio, that's one to one. One, uh, one pocket is burned, one pocket is minted. You can have permissionless gateways. You can have obviously permissionless nodes as it is today. Uh, staking APY could be around 7%, which is right on track with other networks. Uh, and self-dealing is addressed on both chains. Uh, and the self-dealing is addressed on-chain. It's not going through PNF or anything like that. Uh, everything is completely on-chain. So this is where we would love to be to, uh, to be able to launch Shannon uh, and have this tokenomics model uh, available. Now, there's more mechanisms and more things that you can kind of add onto this basic model where you know maybe compute units are kind of a part of this uh, burn to mint ratio, right? But ultimately, keeping things simple, this is what uh, we're ultimately heading for. But the ideal tokenomics can't be achieved yet. And that's because relays are not in an environment where we could actually have this kind of model. So without relays being in this kind of somewhere around 25 billion per day, uh, what that tokenomics model would actually look like if we were to apply it to Shannon uh, at launch is everything would look great except for the staking APY. Staking APY would be less than 1%. You know, uh, we're literally talking 0.08%. That is, uh, that would be a huge transition from Morse to Shannon because now everyone's rewards is significantly reduced uh, to the point where is it even really worth it? Uh, is it even worth having servicers on the network if there's no actual tokenomics to incentivize uh, them to be on the network in the first place? So uh, yeah, it 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 would uh, it would kill pocket staking ecosystem. So we can't do that. Even though we would love to have this model, we can't do that. It can't be applied today because we're just not mature enough yet as a full ecosystem to be able to flip the switch and make it possible. So since we know that the ideal stand and tokenomics are possible, what is possible and what should our goals be for right now for going into Shannon. Number one, permissionless gateways and nodes. Uh, this will allow Pocket's uh, demand side to grow without relying on legal contracts. Then any gateway can just stake Pocket and start using Pocket for relays without having to go through PNF and go through this whole process, which is very burdensome uh, and very much off chain uh, in order to become a gateway. Um, but the flip side of this is like the more people that are able to join in an uh, easy fashion allows the network to get more relays because more people are growing or more people are joining. So that's increasing relays. So by growing the demand, it would allow us to eventually transition into the economic model we want of one to one in a burn mint ratio. Um, number two is enough staking APY. We don't want to crush our staking ecosystem. So we need to have enough staking APY that it keeps people incentivized to have their tokens locked and participate in the network. Uh, and then number three is we have to address self-dealing. Self-dealing is because when one or and two are both a goal and you don't have enough relays to address it, self-dealing becomes a problem, which is what we were talking about before. So in order for you to have number one and two in an economic model, you have to address three. So this is where I'm going to kind of explain currently the challenge with making all three of these goals work together. 
So if you look at this as like a trilemma, you've got staking APY, which you want to keep good enough to incentivize people to participate in the network. You want permission of the gateway so people can just join, they can bring the relays, and we can see demand side grow without needing to go through legal contracts. Uh, and you also don't want uh, self-dealing to happen in the first place. So if we were to enable permissionless gateways, and in a way that addresses self-dealing, it would kill the staking APY, which is what we were talking about before, uh, with the most ideal economic model for Shannon. But if we were to instead, okay, well, let's have permissionless gateways and have good staking APY, well, then we have, uh, we aren't addressing self-dealing because now self-dealing would be able to happen uh, because the mint to burn ratio is off, uh, is off balance uh, in terms of it's not one to one. And a permissionless gateway could just send all their relays to themselves to create an insane uh, return on their burn. So you, you have to address self-dealing uh, as well. Um, or you can go to where we are with Morse today, where we have the staking APY and we've addressed self-dealing through, uh, through PNF, but that means we can't have permissionless gateways. So this is the challenge that we're constantly dealing with, with uh, transitioning from Morse to Shannon. How do we address all these simultaneously? Well, we believe there is a solution and this is what we're looking into. And I'm gonna just kind of touch on what that solution looks like and how it actually can address all three of these issues simultaneously to allow us to transition from Morse to Shannon without needing, you know, 25 billion relays a day. So is this would, you know, it would achieve basically decent balance within pocket where you have 400 million relays a day. The burn to mint ratio is still high, but that's because we want the high staking APY. But with what I'm gonna be sharing, we can still have permissionless uh, gateways and nodes and self-dealing is able to be addressed, but it's able to be addressed on chain via useful QoS is what I'm calling it. So the self-dealing mitigation uh, is able to be done on chain through useful QoS. So with useful QoS, Distributes rewards to all nodes in a session while jailing useless nodes. Um, so instead of a session where you have nodes that are serving different amounts of relays and they get paid for each relay that they serve, each session is kind of seen as a group where that whole group, every node in that session will all get equal rewards. Therefore, there is no benefit to targeting your own nodes with more work because more work doesn't necessarily translate into more rewards. Uh, this is actually how the whole concept of really Shannon's original economics was designed way back in 2021, was the idea of you use fishermen uh, in order to rate nodes and find out which nodes are good and which nodes are bad, so that when you do this distributed reward, you're not paying for terrible nodes. Uh, so this concept has been around in pocket uh, really since the idea of V1 originally came. So there's nothing new here where we're using an, a, a similar model that has already been widely discussed and talked about, but that eliminates the ability to send relays to your own node and create an economic advantage with it. Uh, because regardless if you do it, all the rewards are gonna be spread out to all those nodes. So your node works more than anyone else's node, but everyone all gets paid the same. So it actually doesn't make sense to attack your node in that way. Um, and what and so what Q, uh, what useful QoS will do is if you're distributing rewards to, to nodes, in the uh, original kind of Shannon version, you would have watchmen, which are still expected to come later on down the road with Shannon, uh, just not at launch. Um, but Watchmen would ensure that nodes are at least quality so that you don't have people creating fake nodes and just putting them into sessions and then filling sessions with fake nodes so they can get more and more rewards for not actually doing any work. So you have to be able to kick out and not reward people that are not actually doing some kind of useful work. So that's where useful QoS will jail nodes that are constantly being avoided by gateways. Um, if a node is constantly getting low relays in multiple sessions across multiple gateways, then it's considered useless. Right now, Grove has its own QoS. It's looking for nodes that can properly serve its traffic. So it's testing all the nodes in a session. If a node is not meeting their quality uh, standards, they don't send relays to that node. 
So that node won't get it, that node is being avoided. If say that node that's being avoided by Grove goes into another session and is avoided as well and not sent relays, you can start to see a pattern naturally developing on chain because gateways are incentivized to send nodes or send relays to quality nodes, uh, which will naturally kind of create, and this is why Daniel likes to name implicit, because you're in kind of an implicit fa fashion, you're able to find out who is actually providing real quality uh, to gateways the, uh, based on how gateways are actually using the node. So QoS is not about judging the quality of the node. Uh, it's about the usefulness of the node. And you, def you define usefulness by how much it's being used by apps and gateways on the network. So what does this look like? Okay, so uh, nodes that are constantly performing in what I'm gonna call the low bucket get jailed after multiple sessions. So here at the top, you see there's session one, two, and three. And each of these sessions, you know, are from a different gateway. Uh, and so you have node one, two, three, four, and they're all serving a certain amount of relays. Now you see node four is at the bottom of the bucket because it only served 10 relays. If it's only serving 10 relays, that means that Grove is only sending it a QoS check and then realizing, oh, it's not responding to uh, my request properly, so I'm not even gonna send it any more traffic. So those are QoS uh, relays. Um, and, you know, within, within the network, there's always going to be a base layer that even completely dead nodes will still receive a few relays. So in this case, you see it only received 10 relays while everyone else is uh, receiving uh, tens of thousands. Obviously, that's a bad node. Uh, at least that's what session, Gateway 1 is saying. However, when that node goes to Gateway 2, if it's showing the same result, well, that's starting to build a pretty good case that node two isn't actually connected to anything useful and providing any service. Well, then once you get to session three, it's like, okay, how many times do we need to see this node is not performing uh, before we just go ahead and jail it? So in this system, nodes that are objectively bad get, uh, get jailed because no one wants to work with them. No gateways, no apps, no one's wanting to work with them, at least in some kind of uh, consistent manner, uh, which we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, what those parameters might look like. Um, but we can deem uh, that node four is useless since it is avoided by all gateways. Um, and because, of, because it's avoided by all these gateways, uh, it doesn't receive rewards when it's jailed. So if you, were, if you delay rewards, from a session, so say you uh, session one here, you actually delay the rewards for six sessions. Well, this node is actually jailed in session three. So by the time session six comes around, uh, like six sessions have passed, any jailed nodes would not get any rewards from that original uh, session one. And so you can, by delaying rewards to basically see, hmm, is this node gonna be accepted by other gateways? then you're able to uh, jail the node and it not be a part of the distribution of rewards. So let's look at this uh, in a different way where it's not a objectively bad node and instead, you know, and it's useful within a number of sessions. So on session one, it's still in the bottom bucket, okay? It's still only doing, you know, 70K, even though that's a lot, it's still technically in the bottom bucket. However, in uh, session two, it, is no longer in the bottom bucket. So now it's no longer building that consistent track record of always being in the bottom bucket. And now we have session three, where it's even actually improved more because maybe that gateway's QoS utilizes uh, the setup of that node even more than maybe the other two. And so you can see that a node in most, in most circumstances would be placing in different areas uh, especially since this is going across different sessions, different gateways, it would be ranking different. And you only penalize those in the very bottom bucket in this kind of scenario. So node four is able to still keep operating, even if it gets in the bottom bucket of a session, that's no big deal. It's just if it stays there across multiple gateways and multiple sessions, that's when it would have an issue. And if that's the case, if it's getting jailed because it's constantly in the low bucket, they need to do something to not be in that low bucket anymore because they need to find a way to allow the gateways to consider them useful. Maybe it's the location of where they're at and that's just not where uh, uh, lots of traffic is. You know, maybe uh, they're not 
using enough uh, performance in their cloud setup to where they can uh, handle the amount of relays that gateways are giving them. It, there's all sorts of things that could go wrong. But um, if someone is consistently in the bad bucket, then they need to obviously change something in order to be able to compete with all the other nodes. But most nodes are going to be bouncing around all over the place uh, in terms of their positions in buckets. So uh, the results is then you have res you have rewards that go to only useful nodes. Jailed nodes do not receive rewards in useful QoS since rewards are delayed. And what that does is that prevents folks from creating node stakes without actually running nodes. Uh, like right now, Grove, in a lot of their sessions, a lot of those nodes, they're not even running. They're just like node stakes that are just on the chain, but maybe the person shut down their node, maybe it became too expensive, so they just shut down their node and they didn't bother with going through the unstaking process that are essentially dead nodes. And with this model, they would be completely taken out right from the get-go. Oshansky, go for it. Uh, thanks. Shane, uh, I sorry to interject, but I just kind of wanted to jump in and... Uh, make sure everyone listening, either live or in the future, is on the same page. But like, is it fair to say that what you're presenting now is kind of what your thinking is, what your research is from your experience, uh, from being years in the pocket ecosystem and kind of thinking about it, but none of this is kind of set in stone, none of this is decisive, and this is more to just kind of share your research ideas to get everyone in the ecosystem thinking, or is this more of a, this is what we're moving forward with? Yep, theories. This is theories. So really, yeah. the, the, the trilemma is the problem, right? So if folks have another way of addressing the trilemma, yeah, absolutely. You know, folks can uh, contribute in all sorts of ways. Uh, this is currently what uh, I've, I've been doing. I've been working out this kind of what useful QoS is. Uh, and I've been sharing it with, you know, Oshansky. I've been sharing it with a lot of people. And so we're starting to get more eyes on it. And because we're starting to get more eyes on it, that's why I wanted to go ahead and present it, start getting more minds on it uh, as we flush this out and think through, is this the kind of solution that can address the uh, trilemma that we're dealing with? Yeah. And I think it's also important to call it like, this is an open conversation, right? Whether you're a node runner or a community member uh, or anything, like if you have better ideas on how to do this, uh, you know, present it to the community, discuss it online, offline, whatever we decide to do from a tokenomic perspective will still definitely go through a formal uh, DAO proposal on the forum. Uh, so there's gonna be many discussions to come, uh, but I do wanna call out personally, like I really like where this idea is going. It's also worth calling out Chain. Uh, you know, when we added gateways on Chain, this is from a conversation I had with Chain many years ago, but it is still an open conversation literally up for grabs with any ideas that anyone has. Absolutely. Yeah. As Oshanski mentioned, we've literally been talking about this for years. I mean, Infocon uh, in Dominican Republic. I mean, we were literally walking, walking on the beach, Oshansky and I talking about <laughs> talking about <laughs> permissionless gateways and and how you, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and the challenges of watchers or how watchers could, could be, uh, uh, you know, used. Um, so, yeah, there's a rich history. Uh, well beyond just Oshansky. I mean, uh, talking with Andrew, talking with oh, so many people all over the place about this. So anyways, um, yeah, so all of this is just kind of theories, uh, which is why I, you know, called it theories. Um, and if folks have other ways, you really, at, most of my slides are about painting the issue because that's the issue we have. And with this being a builder's call, the idea is, is let's get the issues out there so that they're clear and, and and people are able to understand them, and then we can come up with the best solutions uh, for those for those problems. I've been thinking about it, and so I'm putting out a theory that people can poke holes in, that people can uh, take and run with. Uh, but ultimately, the the goal is to have the most successful, you know, Shannon launch ever. And to do that, we've got to have good tokenomics. Um, and with mainnet kind of coming up, uh, this is the perfect time to really start having uh open conversations about what tokenomics might look like so uh kind of the last point on this slide is what at least in my mind with this uh useful qos is it would uh it would actually increase the usefulness of sessions so as nodes are eliminated because they're, they're either not useful because they're not configured right uh, or they're completely dead nodes it doesn't matter as more nodes are taking taken out 
uh, because they're showing a consistent track record of being low quality, um, the usefulness of the nodes in a session actually increases. So it would be with something like Grove, when they get a session, it's mostly high quality nodes, if not all the time, high quality nodes. If there's objectively bad nodes, they'll be weeded out quickly across all the uh, different gateways or apps. But for the most part, they're going to have really high quality nodes. So it actually creates even more quality assurance across the whole network uh, because you're looking at, hey, is a node actually being used? And you're deciding, um, should it be participating in rewards or should it be jailed until it's able to be at a level that makes it competitive in the node market? So again, because this is all uh, uh, research and this is all theories, you know, there's still a lot, a lot more research is still underway. Um, you know, some of the challenges of this one and, and what we need to figure out in this theory is you have to figure out, you know, like how many nodes should be in a session? What creates a good, you know, uh, spread of nodes in a session? And then what should those bottom bucket be? Should it be just the, you know, bottom 10%? Should it be the bottom 1%? Like what, what exactly should the bottom bucket be? Uh, that all would need to be, you know, mapped out and figured out, you know, the number of app stakes to create good session spread. So, you know, is it better to have less apps per se and, and bigger sessions, or is it better to have smaller sessions and more apps? Like those are another area that we need to kind of think through. Um, Geozoning is gonna be important because if you get in a session where the traffic is coming from Asia and you're in the US, how do we account for that? Like you're not being penalized because of your quality per se, you're just being penalized because there's a long distance. So we need to be able to, uh, you know, ensure that that's being addressed. The number of sessions before getting jailed, you know, how many times do you have to be in the lower bucket before you get jailed? And then how many sessions should uh, rewards be delayed um, to allow a bad node to get caught out and jailed before it receives any rewards? So those are all just kind of parameters off the top of my mind. The thing that I'm thinking about uh, kind of on a daily basis right now, that, that's where my mind's going. Uh, some of the questions and where people can poke holes in that is if someone has enough nodes, you know, can they monopolize on small chains? You know, self-dealing could still potentially happen if uh, or not enough nodes on a chain and someone brings a bunch of nodes and just starts spamming relays. Um, if they hold a large amount of each session, they could start to gain tokenomics potentially. But at that point, it would actually be easy for the network to respond to it, though, because if someone starts spamming, uh, you know, in a way that's generating reward for them, well, people will then want to transfer their nodes into that or into that chain to participate in all that spamming. So there, there's soft solutions to some of this, but how much of it needs to be like a hard, rigid solution versus a soft solution? Those are the kind of questions that we're thinking through. Another one is, can gateways target specific nodes uh, to jail them? Like, could gateways actually act maliciously and try to, you know, take out certain node runners? Um, you know, we don't really have that kind of ecosystem, but we can't have this trust with every single node uh, or every single gateway on the ecosystem. So, you know, that's something that's still worth looking into. What what are the scenarios around that? And then the last one is, uh, you know, can lazy node runners create their own app stakes to prevent their nodes from being uh, in a low bucket? So if they kind of create a bunch of small app stakes, uh, can they prevent their node from being in the low bucket because they hold a bunch of app stakes and they're able to position their node favorably in their own app stakes? So all this needs to be worked out, but at least right now with kind of the conversations and the open conversations I've been having, all of these can have some kind of solution to them, but there's you know still gonna always be a challenge um, with making sure that we're seeing everything from every angle. So a lot more work is gonna be done in terms of putting all this together in terms of uh, making this something that's presentable to folks. But uh, at least for now, this is kind of one theory that, that we're operating with. If there's other theories, now is literally the time to start getting it out there. We need to be able to transition from Morse to Shannon. Uh, we have testnet coming up. So this is the time to start getting any theory out there that uh, is, um, you know, that can be modeled out, that has legs. And really the best thing that you can do is uh, think about this trilemma. How can you have all of these elements all at play at the same time while achieving our goals? So that's that's kind of Shannon. That's uh, the challenges we're seeing in tokenomics, but that's also kind of where this is where my mind's going. Uh, this is where I've been talking with folks about and a theory that at least 
is worth considering uh, in the larger ecosystem. So any thoughts, questions, anything of that nature? Okay, so for geozoning, is it possible uh, or useful to exclude nodes that are in the same uh, geozone as the app state relays? Yeah, that's, you know, one one area that I'm thinking about is still having, is still something that you stake to. So if you stake to a geozone, nodes need to stake to that geozone as well in order to get in sessions. And then within useful QoS, the bucket is then only relevant with people that are uh, in that geozone because the session is only made up with people in that geozone. Uh, if someone is outside of that geozone, then what the app is most likely be in the bottom bucket because they're the distance is having to travel much farther than all the other nodes. So they would be in the bottom bucket. So it, it's in the best interest of node runners to stake in the right region. So I do believe that geo staking is still a very possible thing to include, and that would probably be the most elegant solution. All right. Well, thanks everyone.